You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers! Here's the tricky method I found on the web. Just type <laughs> in Rufal X's method. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the ToneMob.com podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. I'm Blake Wyland, and with me today I have Justin Holub of Agave Audio. How's it going, man? Doing well. How are you, Blake? Pretty, pretty good. Things have been things have been going well. I'm 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 quite pleased to say the least. So. Yeah, right? I can't complain. after the holidays, and now it's like back to the real world. Kind of. I mean, like I, I, I'm back to the real world, but then I, I remember that in just a couple weeks, I'm going to Nam for the first time, and so I'm like, oh, I right back to the holidays late. again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like really looking forward to that. So, uh, and you know, people keep throwing around, hey, we're gonna get together and do this and that, and I'm like, oh man, I'm getting so excited. <laughs> yeah, it should be great. I'm jealous. Yeah, I did not think I was going this year at the beginning of the year. Um, mm-hmm. So it was kind of a like a a big change to to suddenly change in mindset to suddenly be like, oh, I am gonna go. Oh boy, here we go. I don't know what to expect. <laughs> right. No, you're gonna have a blast. Yeah, yeah. I'm ho- I'm really really excited about it. So anyway. Uh, better start off with the uh, the classic. Uh, how how has your day been? Anything interesting happen? Uh, not too much going on today. Regular day. Um, I'm gonna try doing a a sale on on the uh, Cumbre preamp tomorrow, like a little flash sale thing. I've never done one before, and obviously by the time folks are hearing this, it'll be past. But maybe I'll do another one. So oh, <laughs> keep your eyes peeled, people. Yeah. So we'll see. I'm just kind of, you know, trying some new things, and and uh, we'll see how that happens. But other than that, it's been been a good day, normal day, and it's Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Wednesdays. We're just almost there. We're almost. Yep, Friday. we're almost it's... there. <laughs> nice man, nice. Well, we'll go ahead and get get right into it. Um, you've got to. Uh, uh, a cool little musical backstory. So why don't you uh, tell people where you started and how you got to uh, starting your company and doing what you're doing today? Sure. So um, done quite a bit of stuff and been at it a while. I, you know, like most folks, started playing when I was pretty young, and um, I think I even started playing, you know, like the recorder and piano and kindergarten, elementary school, that sort of thing, and in high school moved into playing drums and guitar followed soon after that and did that all through high school and uh, college went and uh, got my bachelor's in audio engineering uh, here at UNM and after that went to the recording workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio and, and studied there as well and after doing that, went to Sweetwater Sound, where I lived and worked over there for a year in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and learned a lot, and met a great people, a bunch of great people, and it was an incredible experience, and came back to to New Mexico, it was just a little too far from home, and um, you know, I'm currently working on my MBA and started Agave Audio. I figured out when I was in uh, Fort Wayne trying to do you know more recording studio type of stuff that I really knew a lot on the building side of things and the actual engineering and construction and that sort of thing and kind of thought, yeah, well, maybe I should 
try looking more into that. So that's kind of how it started growing, started building amplifiers first, um, built several for myself and friends and that kind of thing. And now I'm taking a stab a little bit and into the pedal world just to see if I can get some stuff out to more people. And I've been having a blast at it. Nice. Nice. So you started with amps. What mm-hmm. was, what was the initial, um, like say your first amp that you built, what was, what kind of, what kind of, uh, what style of amp were you looking at there? The very first thing I built was a kit from Weber and it was just a reverb unit. Oh, okay. Um, so it was a, a reissue of the, the, the Fender tube reverb. And that was the first thing I ever built and I still have it and it still works. And I just did the worst job on it ever. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it now, I'm like, man, that is, that's the worst wiring I've ever seen, and it's mine. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but it was just, you know, the learning process. And, man, that was, that was a long time ago I built that first one. But, yeah, that was the first thing I did. And I think that I chose that one because it was one of the smaller kits, the easier level um, that I could learn on. And, and it's just grown from there. Got you. Got you. So, um, what made you transition from doing more amplifier kind of, you know, the higher voltage stuff? Um, well, not just that. You know what I mean. The high, amplifier sure. world down to the uh, pedals and and smaller circuits like that. Um. Well, it was a couple things because I, I kind of did it backwards. I think more people that I've talked to, you know, start out with nine volts and then move to you know, 400 and I did it the other way around. Um, and I think a lot of that really first came when I was at the recording workshop in Ohio, a friend of mine and the other student there, his name was Jonathan. He had a, uh, Dr. Z amp and he, he brought it with him all the way from Oklahoma. And before then we've all been through this stage as guitar players. I'm sure you have as well, where we all know that the only piece of gear that will get us through anything is that three quarter stack solid state PV. And we think that's the best thing (laughs) in the world. Yeah, man, of course. (laughs) It's it's just good logic. There's no way you can play a house party without that. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's physically impossible. You have to have that. It's it's what you need. (laughs) And so I heard, I heard his amp for the first time, and it really kind of made me sit back and realize, I need to rethink this. Like, why is this so much more open, so much more musical? Um, it makes me play so much different than all the gear that I have. What, what's different about it? And that kind of led down the road of trying to figure out electronically and physically what made it different. And that's what got things started with the amps. And I think that's why I started there. Um, After doing that for, you know, as many years as I have, the transition to trying out some pedal stuff has really been because I've never been much of a pedal person, actually. Um, I own very few and I seldom use them. And I kind of thought, well, I wonder if I could build something that I would use more that is kind of more like an amp. It works a little more that way that, would integrate with my rig better and that's kind of where the Cumbre preamp came from gotcha gotcha you also have an, another pedal that I, I know you haven't brought up yet um sure let's talk about that and then we'll get into the the Cumbra because the Cumbra is newer so let's talk right. about your first one and, and the it, genesis and the other, of that yeah and the other one's not a pedal it, well right it's built, sorry built in a pedal a... enclosure no worries mm-hmm. um So it's called the loadout, and it works um, similar to a few other things on the market, and it's basically a direct box for your guitar amp. So from your amp, you can come directly out of your speaker output into the loadout, and inside of the loadout, you have a choice of either using the internal load, or you can send it back to your cabinet if you'd like. And then it has a transformer balance direct out, that's an XLR out that you can take that send and go straight into a mixing board console, that kind of thing. And my idea with that was kind of twofold that I knew myself recording, you know, at home or, you know, folks in an apartment, that kind of thing. 
Um, you can't always record whenever you want to, however you want to, especially doing guitar stuff. It's loud. We, you know, it's just the nature of it. Right. But wouldn't this be great if, you know, we could just go straight in? And there are other, some others out there. I know the uh, Mesa Cab clone does a few. I believe there's another by Radial that also do some things like this. Um, but what I wanted to do was think, okay, well, how can I do it and make it more part of the amp so it's all hand wired point to point like a high quality amp would be um to try to kind of integrate that experience of it being more part of your amp than a than another piece of gear on down the road right right so um on that note i haven't done a lot of direct in recording i have done direct in um we did a DI on on pretty much every guitar track that on my band's uh, last album. In addition to mm-hmm. our mic'd tone, um, just to have stuff to play with uh, for reamping down the road. Um, sure. But but this is a little bit different. What you're talking about, you're talking about actually running the amplifiers output direct in, which I've never done. Um, is do you think you? I mean, of course, in some situations it's going to be necessary, like you've you've talked about. But do you lose something um, by not having that speaker moving air, or what's your opinion on? I have no opinion sure. on it because I've never tried I it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say you lose it, but it is very different. I will never say that you know any piece of electronics is going to one hundred percent mirror what a, a moving speaker cone can do. Um, it, it never will. Can they come close? Sure. But is it the same? No, it mm-hmm. never will be. And that's okay that it's, you know, is, is it something that you'd want to use for all of your core guitar tracks? Eh, maybe not. Is it a great thing that you can fill in, you know, some of that area that you haven't been in sonically? Um, great way to kind of come at things a different way, or if the moment's there and you need to record, but you're not able to, you can. Um, I noticed too it changed how I played a little bit. So since I wasn't standing in front of an amp and feeling the, the room move, um, some of that kind of came out different, you know, whenever I listened to it in the mix. And that's what I liked about it is just because it was such a great complement to uh, the actual mic'd signal as well. And that's why I included the switch on there. So if you want to send it back to your cab, you can. So if you want to mic it and have the DI, you can have both of those. You can blend them one, the other. It's up to you. Ooh, I like that. I didn't realize there was a blend. That's cool. Well, you'd have to blend it later on, you know, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in you know, Pro Tools or whatever you're using. But oh, you do have okay. access to both. Gotcha. It gives I, you I both sends. I follow you. Okay. Very nice. That's cool. Yeah. I think that sounds like a really... Uh, useful piece of studio gear like yeah and it's it's kind of tailored towards a specific you know player too because it it's, won't do everything under the sun to fit it in that portable you know enclosure like that because it, so it'll handle up to a 30 watt amp and currently the amp would have to have an 8 ohm speaker out on it those would be the two requirements but other than that you're good to go that, that covers a lot of ground i mean yeah for sure that that yeah there's lots of amps that fit that description so Cool, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right on. Let's uh, move into the Kumbra, which uh, I have got the opportunity to, to play, and I really enjoy. So uh, why don't you why don't you talk about um, kind of the genesis of, genesis of that and what you were shooting for? Yeah. So what I was kind of going for is a lot of the amps that I play and the ones that are my favorite are either they are vintage or they're a vintage style, you know, they're, they're new construction, but built on the same philosophy anyway. Um, so most of them are all sync one channel, you know, um, some of them are master volume, some of them aren't, but definitely nothing that ever had any switching channels or that kind of thing in them. That's just right. what I always gravitated to. And I've noticed time and time again, there's some times where, you know, I would want just a little bit more, or I'd want a little bit less, or I'd want a little bit of coloration difference between songs that I was playing. Nothing extreme, but just a little bit of presence different and a little bit of gain structure difference. And that's kind of where this came from. And so, because I, I initially was looking to buy myself a like a boost pedal, 
and tried a few out and they all worked, but they didn't they didn't quite work the way I wanted them to. It didn't sound the same way to me cuz it sounded like I was going through a pedal. It sounded great. I'm not saying that that's a bad sound. It's not at all. It sounds incredible, but I wanted it to sound like it wasn't there. Right. And so that's kind of when I set out, okay, well, let's try building one. And I had never done anything 9 volt before, so that was a little bit of a learning curve. But I got I got in there and figured it out not too bad. Um, so, again, it's point-to-point hand-wired. Put in as few components as I could and try to get those really honed in to where you didn't need as much adjustment. My idea was that hopefully by making it very simple, it will end up being very musical and very versatile and allow you, the player, to be able to change how you want it to sound based on your playing. Right. And so it has just the, you know, you can turn the preamp on and that's your first level of, uh, you know, increasing gain. And you have a, you know, a pod on there to really hone that in. And then you have the other... uh, foot switch to add a little bit more boost and what's interesting about it is that it only uses one jfet transistor there's not actually two levels of gain it's um it's just using the one and it seemed to be very seamless and smooth when i had tried it out and designed it which i really enjoyed right yeah i liked uh i really liked how it sounded um i I generally play with a lot of pedals just because I'm I'm an addict, and I sure. I admit it. You know, it's I've just, seen I've it's... seen the pictures of your cabinet. <laughs> I'm I'm hopelessly addicted, and it's just I've come, <laughs> I've come to terms with it, and I'm okay with it, and everyone else should be too. Anyway, including my wife. Anyway, um, I I uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, um, Good. but you, what you, I like you you keep working that that one there. Or Blake. Yeah, maybe if she I, listens to it to enough of the uh, enough podcasts, she'll say, "Okay, it's okay. You can have another pedal cabinet." She doesn't listen. To, <laughs> I tried to get her. I was like, "Hey, check this out. Like, like you, you got to be interested in what I'm doing. I'm doing this thing. This is cool, right?" And she's like, listens to like 20 minutes of one, and she's like, "I don't know what you guys are talking about right now." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, okay. I get. I I'm sorry. I. I don't know what the people on your reality television show are talking about either. So, I right. guess. <laughs> tomato, I guess. tomato. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so, anyway. Um, but what I liked about the Kumbra was there are times where I don't, I don't play with that much uh, in the way of pedals. Sometimes I just want to kind of, I just kind of want to rock out. And I have a few um, overdrives that are kind of like, some of my go-to sounds, um, the uh, Mad Professor Sweet Honey has been one for a long mm-hmm. time now, um, and the uh, I really like my Spaceman Affilian, and um, recently fell in love with the Solid Gold Effects Zeta. So I got a couple mm-hmm. go-to, go-tos that are just like my, I need an overdrive, oh, I'll grab that one, you know, type sure. of thing. Um, and also, I have a little bit of room in my in my in my life for going straight into the amp sometimes. So, um, anyway, where I was going with that is I found it to be great for when you're getting just that overdrive sound, whether you're pushing a pedal or you're pushing your amp and then mm-hmm. having, but essentially having, you know, a, a huge amount of sounds by having not that many uh, pedals. Is what I was right. getting at. If that made any sense, I was kind of rambling. Um, <clears throat> I followed you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Well, I that's kind of. I was oh, looking at something that was about to make a lot of racket, and I was like, "Oh no, it's gonna, it's gonna." Oh, uh, and then it stopped. Oh no. Okay. Whew. Stressed me out for a second. <laughs> 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 um. Anyway. But yeah, you can essentially get like three gain stages plus whatever you're doing with your volume knob. Um, and then it's just very versatile without using that much is what, what mm-hmm. I liked about it. So, And what I've, you know, the way that I've been using it a lot lately is I'll turn, you know, I'll turn it on and I'll get it dialed into where I just have that rhythm edge breakup tone. 
and then I can either turn the, the preamp off if I need clean, or I can engage the second boost if it's time to take a solo or something. And it seemed to stay out of the room of my amp very well. Um, and that's what I think is so cool about pedals is that there are so many different options for every type of player. Um, you know, there's people that want, like me, the pedal to do, to be very transparent. And there's other folks that want that pedal to color everything. And mm -hmm. then there's everything in between. And so that's, you know, it's cool to, I think, to design something and engineer something that fits on that far side of that spectrum because there's so many things in there and it's really fun. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and I, I kind of change with the wind. Some days, you know, I'll have a board set sure. up with, you know, 12 pedals and all of them are on. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's, that's not the case. Like I was talking about earlier, I just want a simple basic thing and, and turn up and rock. So it, it, my mood, I'm like a, I'm like a bipolar gear nerd or something. It's all, it's always totally. back and forth. You know, I can never just have one set up and call it a day. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like that that pedal can fit into either of those rigs. So um, yeah, and I've noticed that it it seems to fit well with a lot of stuff, and it changes a lot with stuff. It to me, it sounds completely different depending on what guitar I'm using. Sounds completely different on what amp I'm using, especially what amp I'm using, because it's it's just changing how the amp behaves. So that you know changes the whole ball game on what amp it's being, you know, pushed into really. Mm -hmm. um, and I, even with my, uh, my fiance's father, he plays, uh, every week, every other week and like a happy hour trio and he right. just plays acoustic and he has a pedal board and his acoustic guitar into his pedal board. And then he just goes straight into a PA. That's, that's what works for him. And so we tried it out and I was shocked at how good it sounded with his acoustic. That's interesting. Yeah, because that would... it, it was never meant for that. I never designed it to do that. And we did. We tried it. We just, you know, and it, it really worked. It extended the frequency range. It played lower without being boomy. It got present without being harsh or brittle. It sat well with the band. It really, I was shocked at how well that worked with acoustic. Well, that's great. I'm going to have to give that a try. I don't play yeah. nearly as much acoustic um, as I should. Um, but yeah, actually, I'm going to give that a try. I didn't even think about that. Well, that's kind of been the fun part with it is just going and, you know, putting it with stuff I would have never thought to put it with. Um, every time I go and hang out with, you know, my buddies or I'm going to a show or whatnot, I bring it along with me. It's like, hey, let's try it with what you got. And I've been impressed with everything we've put it in front of. And it's so cool to see how differently it behaves with everything. Nice, man. Nice. Very cool. So, since we're talking about rigs, sure, and um, I'd like to hear what your current rig looks like. Sure. So, currently, um, and I'm I'm kind of like you. I switch between a bunch of different things. Um, I have three electrics that I primarily uh, switch between. I have a Les Paul Standard. I think it's a 2004. And I have a 52 reissue telly and a Rickenbacker 660 uh, solid body six string. So it looks, it's just like the one on the uh, Tom Petty Damn the Torpedoes album, but it's mm -hmm. the six string instead of the 12. Gotcha. Those are the three that I use most of the time. And um, I've been using the, the Cumbre Boost now. That's been the pedal that I've been using. Mm -hmm. The other two that I have that I use from time to time is I have a Keeley Red Dirt Overdrive and um, the Exotic RC Booster. Oh, and I, don't, I, don't I forget about that pedal. That's a cool pedal. Yeah. yeah, and don't use them that often. And when I do, I'm very subtle with them, I find to sell myself doing a lot of times. Um, but I'm using those. Um, my main amp is also either one of the plethora of things that, that I've built, <laughs> which are all over the place, and those just kind of go from mood to mood. Um, the other one that I have that somebody else has built is I also have a, a Dr. Z. It's a Maz 18 
not no reverb head and cab um and that cab has a the vintage 30 in it gotcha gotcha um but i have several other things that i play with that i've built myself that are um either they are a clone on something or there's something totally different or a different take on something that someone else has done um i just got it i got a bunch of stuff lying around the house <laughs> Of course. And that's really that's really what my main rig is that I'm using currently. Pretty simple. And I'd like to integrate some more stuff into it at different times, but I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like I don't need to as much, or I just it it, it fulfills what I need it to do most of the time, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. If it's doing what you want, then you know, it's hard to argue with that. Sure. And then here lately, I really have been playing a lot of acoustic. Um, it's kind of nice being so um, heavily in electric land, you know, to take a break from all the amps and the pedals and electric guitar and just go sit in the quiet room with my acoustic guitar and, and just play just me, you know. And for that, I have a, I have a hummingbird. It's my oh, very nice. Very nice. Mm hmm. That's part of my problem, I think, why I don't play acoustic very often is I don't have a nice acoustic, which is kind of a shame. Um, there's no reason that I, I shouldn't, um, but I don't at this time. I have a, I have a old, not old, um, but an Ibanez acoustic guitar that, you know, cheapo. I think that was mm -hmm. actually my, my very first guitar that was my own. Um, sure. And it it probably could play and sound decent if it had a decent setup and everything, but I don't know. I guess the interest isn't there for me or something. I do I do love going over to my buddies or my dads. They both have really nice um, SJ two hundreds, which is my favorite acoustic mm -hmm. guitar, and uh, I I love playing both of those. So I don't know. We'll see. I I might get one of those one of these days or uh, some. I don't know. Then it's like, should I get something else? Because both they have, you know, SJs. Should I get something sure. different? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. And it's always, it's it's that opportunity cost. There's always a million amazing pieces of gear I would love to have. And when I get to buy one, there's, you know, I can't buy them all. And I do have to make a hard decision. <laughs> I know. Why can't we buy them all? I don't understand. It's not fair. It is not fair. They should all just be free. Says, says Joe, the guy Joe who's Bob making gear and trying to sell it. That's counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Joe Bonamassa gets to buy it all. How come I don't get to? Right? It's just not fair. It isn't. I'm going to throw a fit. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you something when you mentioned that you had the Rickenbacker. So yeah. I, I also have a Ricky. I have a 360 six-string. and okay. um. A couple notes about that. I haven't talked about this in a little while, but I bought that because I loved how it looked and I, I liked how it played. And I was surprised that I, I found myself using it for really heavy, filthy, disgusting, often drop tuned gu guitars. Not what mm -hmm. I anticipated mm -hmm. on using that for at all. Um, but me and me and my buddies were just like, man, this thing sounds way better, just like with lots of distortion or fuzz than it does clean to me. I don't know why that is, but I'm curious if you notice the same thing with your Ricky, or if you even play ever and that heavy. I I, I do. I tend to grab. I don't use that one that much. For I should try it. Is yours yours is a semi hollow, Rick? Yeah. Okay. That that may be part of it because that'll resonate a lot lower. Um, right. Whereas mine's completely solid. I don't know. I should try that. I noticed what, when I was using mine, it just, um, it kind of filled gaps that I uh, was hearing that I'd want for parts or for certain things um, that the other normal palette of guitar tone didn't quite fill if that makes any sense it's just like the time every time you need a gretch you know that's yeah. only that's the only thing that's going to make that sound um yeah but no i should try it heavier i usually don't i mean i've gotten up to like classic rock level with it i guess but not right. more than that i should it, it's i don't know like do you have the high gains or the toasters in that thing? it's the toasters the toasters yeah so i got the high gains 
I played um, my friend's dad's, uh, I can't remember which model, but it had the toasters. Mm-hmm. It, might, it might have been a 330 with the toasters. I can't remember. Um, but, it, you know, they had the, to me, they had very similar characters. Um, obviously, there was some things that the toasters had a little more sparkle and high end and obviously not as much output. But I could tell right. they were from the same gene pool. Sure. Um, so I didn't play that super high gain, but yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm the only person that I know of that does that on a regular basis other than, um, Kurt from, uh, from Converge, who's, uh, mm. that's the only band that comes to mind that I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to pipe in with, with other ones, but that's the only one that comes to mind that plays a Rickenbacker. Uh, he, he plays the, uh, he plays a 360 that I, I've seen him play a 360 and also the, uh, um, 660, uh, I believe. I can't remember what model, but he plays both the semi hollows and the and the solid body. So it's interesting, and that band's about as about as heavy as it gets. So sure, I yeah, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to try it out on that. I I have them before. I mean, there's no reason for it not to sound good. You know, it may not be what you're always used to hearing, but it'll do it. You know, for sure. It, it's definitely a different character. There, it just there's like all these frequencies that you you don't normally hear with a you know a standard humbucker guitar or something. Mm-hmm. It's just really really interesting. Well, and I've noticed even myself um, playing heavier on my Les Paul. I like to I notice myself backing the pickups further and further away from the strings, essentially giving it a little bit lower output and letting the amp do a little more of the work and. I've really been enjoying that lately, so no reason to think that the toasters on the Rick couldn't do it also. Yeah, that's that's an interesting concept. I haven't tried messing with my Les Paul for a long time. I might have to give that a try. And where that came from is I was I was messing with it a bunch one day, and I had found you know Gibson specs of where they wanted at and all these things, and it just wasn't sounding the way I wanted it to, probably because I messed with it too much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I started looking at a bunch of old pictures, and I noticed how many of them, the pickups were set really low, much lower than what Gibson Spec said. And I tried it, and I absolutely loved it. How much further down, roughly, would you say you, you sank oh, them in? Oh, pretty, pretty far. It was just a little bit, a uh, little raised above flush. Hmm. It, it was pretty far down. And I actually put lower pickup, lower output pickups in that anyway. When I bought that Les Paul, it came with the um, uh, the Burst Bucker fives, I believe, or Pros. Mm-hmm. Burst Bucker Pro had a um, an Eco five magnets in it, and I replaced them with the. Oh boy, now you're making me think of what things are called. Um, it has the Alnico two? It's still the Burst Bucker. I'm trying to remember what it's called. Something classic. Anyway, every, anyway, everyone, everyone listening is going. You know what it is? It's that commercial where everyone's screaming botulism. <laughs> the answer is botulism. That's what we're right. doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, but that's uh, all so right. anyway, that's made him Google's lower for. output. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> made him lower output, and then still lowered him in the guitar even. Very interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna be trying that next uh, string change. I think. Good call. Yeah, definitely. And okay, I need to go rewind because there was something else I wanted to talk to you about the Rickenbacker about. Sure. So you're you're one of the only guys that I know that fits this bill as I do, um, and that is I both I I love Telecasters and I love Les Pauls, and there's not really anything I just hate, but you know th- I really like both those guitars for different reasons, and I sure. also really like the Ricky. And I don't have a problem with the neck, like so much people, so many people do. Um, it's completely different, you know, much mm-hmm. flatter, and much, it's a completely different neck than either of those guitars. And I have no problem with it. Like it took a, a little bit of getting used to, just because I never played with that on a regular basis. But it's comfortable. Right. I can, I find it very fast, and yes. uh, I dig it. And I don't really understand the the gripes. I guess. I think some of the the thing that caught me off guard is how wide it was when I first got it. 
Um, mm-hmm. that, that took me a little bit of, of getting used to. Um, and it did feel different. Um, and I think the only time, but this is true for any of my guitars, that it gives me a problem is if I play one for 15 minutes and then I switch and play the other for 15 minutes and then I switch. If I do that, then I'm kind of bogged down, you know, because it feels so different each time. Okay. Um, yeah. But if I yeah. but if I just pick if I just pick any of them up and and just play that particular one, it you know maybe it takes me you know two three minutes and then I kind of get back into it. it's like oh yeah I'm playing this one and no it doesn't give me doesn't give me any problem. Right. Yeah. It's just to me it's just um it's just different. Um, it's not better or worse. Like some people are just like I hate the Rickenbacker necks and it's like okay mm. I I can understand if that's not what you're used to why you would not like it, but I mean, um, I don't know. I just find I, after just a little bit of getting to know the guitar, I, I really, I really enjoy it. And it makes me play in a different way, um, that I find pretty inspiring. So, well, that's, that's the best part about the whole thing. And that's, that's the reason to have different guitars is because it does make you play different and it sounds different. It inspires you different. And, and yeah, there's no, we're going to get on a philosophical level here now. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. There's no piece of gear that's better than another. Really, music's subjective. So as long as it's you know works the way it is supposed to work, um, maybe it's not your preference. But there's no guitar that's better than another guitar, or a pedal better than another pedal, or an amp better than another amp because they're all different. They're all different tools. They all serve different purposes. Um, it's like trying to say a you know a number two Phillips is better than a number one. It, no, they're different tools for different things, and that's what's so great about it, and why we need more of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's why we need all the gear, like we already exactly. Uh huh. <laughs> that's a good. That's a really good point because I mean, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest. I'm I've said well that whatever is no good. I've been that guy before, but you know. Like you say, if you take a step back and say, well, it's no good for what I'm trying to do with it, but obviously somebody's using it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise it wouldn't be, yeah, I'm, sp- I'm speaking specifically about like the metal zone. I mean, sure. most people would say that that pedal is no good. I even wrote an article about how I didn't really care for that pedal and how to make it better. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, really, it's it serves its purpose obviously because they sell them by the bucket full. So, right. Maybe maybe that purpose is to you know sell a cheap pedal to a fourteen year old. But either way, it's serving its purpose, I guess. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> well, and I think there's there's two different ways at that. Um, the first one is is something we talked a lot about when I worked at Sweetwater, and it's the fine wine principle. And when you are first able to to drink and you have your first glass of wine, it all tastes terrible, right? And then you start to think, okay, well, I I kind of like this. I'm gonna I'll, I'll have a little bit of this, and and you get the the three dollar bottle because yeah, that's what you can afford, and everything else you're like, I can't taste the difference, right? I'm just I'm gonna pay three bucks. And as you keep having wine over the years, I'm like, okay, well, I, I can taste a little bit of difference in that $13 bottle. And you can see where I'm going that, you know, mm-hmm. that happens. And then you'll get that super wine connoisseur that loves that $3 bottle. And I think the same thing can be done with gear that you, you're totally right. There's, there's gear built um, to grow through. Um, But you can take something that may be considered an entry-level product and put it in the hands of somebody that can be innovative and creative with it, and something really different and magical can happen that you would have never expected would have come from that. Um, I remember, I forget when this was, I was uh, with a bunch of people playing, and Somebody had it was it was a cheap I don't even remember the brand cheap electric guitar that you would you would buy at Toys R Us or you know something like that it was not even really an instrument you know it was the the 40, <laughs> right the forty nine dollar you know guitar amp combo deal and I played it and I hated it I just hated it I was like this isn't even a real instrument and it got passed around the circle and it got to one of the guys in the group. 
And for whatever reason, it just sounded amazing. And I thought <laughs> to myself, I, I couldn't make it sound like that. These other seven people couldn't make it sound like that. How do you make it sound like that? I'm like, I don't know. It just, it was just working. I don't, you know, he didn't do anything. It's like, <laughs> what, it's like, well, what did you do to it? Well, I plugged it in, you know, and just for whatever reason it, it happened. So I think a lot right. of that kind of stuff is out there. Um, and you got to be open to those possibilities as a musician. I think it's a, it's an important thing to remember. And like I said, guilty of it, of myself for, for uh, being a gear snob, you know, quote mm-hmm. unquote, there's no other, there's no polite way to put it. That's what I would, what I am being when I am thinking that way. And, totally. and, uh, Rick Sell from a uh, pure Salem guitars on one of the, the older podcasts, he made a really good point about, um, you know, the Montgomery Ward airline guitars, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. You know, back in the day, those were considered garbage. Right. Like nobody, nobody looked at those and was like, "Man, those were co- those are so rad. Those are so cool." You know, until Jack White comes along and yeah. makes these ridiculous sounds with it, and now they're cool. And I'm totally, you know, guilty of of that. Like the first time I heard that that's what he was playing, I laughed, and then I listened to it and was like, "Oh wow!" And now I really want one, and I really want a silver tone. 1484 and mm-hmm. it's like those were those were the lowest of the low back in the day right those were and for now, the, the people that couldn't afford a real one right yeah. and now now here i am it just took some other person to innovate with it and to make me realize what was possible and now i'm now i'm like gotta get one <laughs> so uh, it's not about not about what tools you have it's about how you use the tools you do have Mm-hmm. Most definitely. And like you said, you know, I, I guarantee you, though, if I ever do acquire that exact same rig, I'm not going to sound like Jack White. So No. Why do, <laughs> we're such fickle characters, these guitar players. It's so weird. Even though right. I know that I'm not going to sound that good, I still want it. <laughs> it's so right. stupid. Well, it, it, it lets you see... Uh, it inspired you to see how somebody made that into something that it wasn't originally. And, and that's inspiring for any musician, I think, to see how can I take something and, and be creative with it. Um, you know, really, I mean, that's how we got all of the digital based instruments. You know, some, when the computer came around, someone thought, Hey, well, how can I make music with this thing? It's not supposed to make music. Let's do it. And, <laughs> right. here, and here we are, you know, no kidding. Well, I, and I just kind of clicked a light bulb in my head. You know, another good example of something being under undesirable and now, but starting to fetch a hefty price. People started seeing a, a TS10 on John Mayer's board, and now those things are expensive. You know, it's like uh, right. it's just it's just kind of comical to think about how it, we 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 like to we'd like to think that we're not influenced in that way, but we totally are. It just, oh, uh, we, we totally are. I think I can't name any guitar player I know that didn't start off with a a handful, a very small handful, if not one player in mind of, I want to sound like that. And you look at what that guitar player was using, and and when we're starting out, we don't really know. You know, you see, oh, he's using a Marshall, and you don't you don't know there's different types of Marshalls. You're 13. <laughs> You know, right. <laughs> um, and so you get a Marshall. That's what you need. And it's like, oh well, he plays. You know, uh, his cable's blue. I need a blue cable. You know, it's of not course. a brand. Just, just the color is going to make the difference. <laughs> <laughs> it's just good science. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's how so much of it starts. Um, I know I was like that. I'm sure you have a similar story. Oh, oh, definitely. Definitely. I, my biggest problem was, I think, um, it's it's kind of interesting because my dad's a guitar player also, mm-hmm. um, and he's played forever. But he is not a he is not into gear at all. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, it, it's it's really interesting. So, um, and I wasn't into gear for when I first started because I didn't know that you needed to be into gear. Because like, well, my dad never 
talks about anything. He's like, I'd like to get a Telecaster someday. And then he goes and plays his, his acoustic guitar, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's just kind of funny that I went like the total opposite direction where I'm like just gear obsessed. So it, I, it took me a long time. I had played for, you know, a good five years probably before I even realized why I sounded the way I sounded. It, you know, it was like, it was kind of, sure. it was kind of, it was kind of a strange experience. Um, I remember, you know, playing, <laughs> you're going to laugh. Um, the band I started off with, um, it was, I mean, pretty much like everybody. It was a boy. Was listen, a listen to you stall there. You don't eat, you're like ashamed to even admit it. <laughs> oh no, not, no, I'm not. Cause I still listen oh, to some okay. of this stuff. It's just like it's just pretty much everybody kind of in my generation started out this way, and it was like a punk rock and hardcore thing, right? Sure. Well, then now this is why it's embarrassing. Not because of that. I still listen to some of that music, but because I, my my parents had me convinced that I could probably get away with playing those songs with my acoustic electric guitar just plugged into the PA or something. Oh well, heck yeah! <laughs> and then you just turn the PA up so loud that it distorts, and you're there. And that that was, and that's what I tried to do. I tried to do that. <laughs> it, and as you can predict, it was a complete disaster. And um, every band practice was a complete disaster because I didn't even have a, a proper electric guitar. And you know, I didn't play electric guitar on a normal basis until you know we played our high school battle of the bands. I borrowed uh -huh. some guys like. Uh, you know, his solid state fender that had a distortion channel on it. I don't know, it could have been an ultimate chorus or something, I'm not sure. But and then uh played my dad's he had a uh uh 335S from like the late seventies, early eighties. So it was like a three thirty five mm -hmm. shaped solid body. Okay. And uh that's what I played at the high school battle of the bands and that was like one of the first times I played an electric guitar for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And and ironically, it sounded not too bad in comparison to yeah. what we'd been sounding like <laughs> before that. So, um, <laughs> well, I remember my my guilty story of that is um, I didn't have anybody else. Like my my folks didn't play guitar. Um, my mom sings, and my dad is he plays the radio really well. Right. Um, but he was very much into. Um, you know, classic rock and hot rod cars and all that kind of stuff. So when I was little, I grew up listening to what he listened to. Mm -hmm. And my poor parents have heard so much Leonard Skinner when I was <laughs> young. I can't tell you how many times I made those poor people suffer through Freebird <laughs> over and over and over. And my first guitar was a PV T. 60 the super wooden looking one. Oh and yeah those are actually supposed to be not half bad not that i've played yeah them, I, I still have it under the bed i don't play it nice. that much but i still have it um but before i had that i um i decided i wanted to play bass then when i when i first moved from drums into like a string instrument i thought oh i'll do bass no kidding my thought was four strings will be easier than six and i found out quickly i was wrong right um <laughs> And so I had a little heart key bass amp. It was a 12-inch speaker bass amp. And so when I got the guitar, I was using that bass amp. I had no way to distort anything, so I'm, tr I'm turning this amp up more and more to make it distort because I've read that that's how you make that happen. I have no clue it's a bass amp, and it ain't going to <laughs> distort for you know all the tea in China. Right. <laughs> so this <laughs> blistering loud completely clean, you know, 13-year-old trying to learn Freebird and all of that. Um, I need to go thank my parents. I should go there after <laughs> I'm done on the phone. <laughs> oh, man. That sounds so familiar. Oh, wow. This is just bringing back all kinds of embarrassing memories for me right now about my early days. Yeah. And trying to, trying to, you know, trying to figure out, oh, man, that's so funny that you brought up the bass thing because that's, my one of my friends that I grew up with, he's he was a primarily a drummer, and he was very mm -hmm. talented. He's just one of those naturally talented guys. And then he started playing guitar, 
and you know, I always thought being in a band would be the coolest thing in the world, and it kind of is. But yeah. um, you know, I back then I was like, oh, this is gonna be awesome, and he's like, you should pl- be the drummer. I had no idea what I was doing, and it was a it was a nightmare. I've talked about this before, but it was it was terrible. I'm a better drummer now, and I'm still not a drummer. It's just it was it was absolutely terrible. Yeah. But then, so I thought, same thing, exactly what you said. Well, four strings look easier than six, so I'll try playing the bass. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember like telling my parents, I want a bass for Christmas or something, and they're like, you know, and and they don't really know anything about the bass. Like I right. said, my dad dad was a guitar player, but he just played acoustic guitar pretty much. So he didn't give much thought to a bass rig or, or anything like that. And he's like, well, call around to the guitar stores and get some prices, and we'll see if we can get you one for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> oh, man, this is, this is bad. And so I'm like 11 or 12. And so I call up Guitar Center, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for a bass. Uh, how much are they? <laughs> and the guy's like uh you know from forty dollars to thousands of dollars i'm like oh okay he's like why don't you come in and try some like well i don't really know how to play he was like well what kind of music are you trying to play i'm like i don't know but i definitely want the bass to be distorted not really realizing that most of the songs I was listening to, 99% of them, did not have distorted bass. Right. And and so I'm like, I want an amp that's going to distort. And he's like, no, you don't. And I'm like, yes, I do. And I have this 11-year-old kid arguing with the guy. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the... This guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. I want one that distorts. No, you like, well, he's like, well, he did. Like, what kind of music do you want to play? I'm like, I don't remember what it was at the time, but I was just like, oh, this, this, and this. And he's like, yeah, you don't want it. You don't want that to distort. And, <laughs> oh, man, this That's is funny. highly embarrassing. And I'm just airing my dirty laundry out all over the interwebs right now. Sure. But you know what? <laughs> you know what's funny? And why I, it doesn't bother me that much is it doesn't matter who I've talked to. We every musician I know has a story just like that. Oh yeah, so you got to start somewhere. You all start somewhere, and um, nobody, you know, knew everything about it in the beginning. None of us did, and, and it's good to, to share our pain with each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I want everybody to um, who's listening right now to email me their embarrassing gear stories so that. So that me and Justin aren't like the only ones sitting here cringing. Watch, we're gonna. Nobody else is gonna have one. It's just me and you. Everybody, <laughs> everybody else is perfect. <laughs> They're gonna email and be like, "You, you are an idiot." I'm not listening. <laughs> Unsubscribe. Unsubscribe. Yeah, I can. I can see the uh, Instagram numbers falling as we speak. <laughs> oh no! I've worked so hard. There they go. See you later, guys. Nice knowing you. Please come back. Oh, I'm, that's funny. I'm a little better now. <laughs> oh man, that is that is good times. That is very good times. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Let's see. Before we get too off track, we are nearing the hour mark, but I think we got time to dive into one more classic question. That sure, I have. sounds good. So, w- you went through your current rig. What would your dream rig look like? Hmm. Can I only get one? Um, well, I'm not going to be that harsh, but I mean, if you, <laughs> of course see, well, you can, can have more than one. We're t- this is a gear podcast, but I, I like, can, I can think of a few pieces that I've really been wanting. Okay, let's um, go with I've that. I've been really looking at here. Uh, lately, I, I know I don't have the money, but I'd love to have them. Okay, um, okay let's see. Guitar-wise, I've I've owned a few Strats in my life, but I always end up selling them. So I would love to find a Strat that I don't sell. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but yes, it does. Um, I would like to have a nice bass. Um, I would like to get back into that. Um, now, now that I know four strings is more difficult than six. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been looking at some of the, 
like the vintage P bass, jazz bass stuff. But yeah, you, you know, I've been even now too. It's, it's just now there's so many options. Like that's why that's such a hard loaded question. Almost is that I know I would love to try this builder's special custom thing, and I'd love to try this guy's special amp thing. And there's just so many different you know things out there. Um, but really, where I think the next part of a lot of my money is going to go is actually into some recording equipment. Ah, okay. And I've done the whole Pro Tools thing and, you know, with, you know, my recording background and I had a recording, you know, a Pro Tools rig and all that kind of stuff and um, really grew out of it. And I know if you're going to operate a commercial studio, that's, you know, you have to do that. That's just the way it is. And there's certainly Mm -hmm. a lot of good things about it. But when I went to school for it, all the stuff that I really wanted to learn didn't exist anymore. You know, tape, analog boards, really uh, uh, n- changing things with mic placement, um, plate reverb units, you know, all these cool old things back when an engineer, you were called an engineer because you actually built that mixing desk you were working on. All that kind of stuff's gone. So I would love to dive back and to rediscover some of that history and not just read about it, but actually get to use some of it. Um, So one thing I did just buy not too long ago was um, a used Tascam half-inch 8-track. Oh, cool. Reel-to-reel. And I haven't gotten to use it yet because I had to to buy a new capstan belt and do do some work on it. But I'd love to get that up and running and get a cool old desk to work. Maybe I'll build a desk. That's Ooh. an idea. Agave Audio consoles. Ooh. Look out, I Richard Neve. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, but that would be fun. I don't know. But anything like that, I would love to rediscover kind of how a lot of this stuff happened. Um. And I understand why we are where we are. That's just the way it is. And certainly that has a lot of advantages like editing stuff. Um, no, nobody wants to splice tape anymore. I get it. But it would be so neat to relearn how that happens so that you can better use the technology that you have now, I guess. Yeah. Um, I know what you mean. Um, I, I, you know, that, that all that old equipment is like highly... Um, kind of romanticized to a degree yes. and it's very and with good reason and i'm just i'm kind of fascinated by it all even though i'm far from any kind of recording engineer at all i have been around some some uh, people who know way more about it and so i've kind of gleaned a little bit of information from them but mm-hmm. um but yeah there's there's kind of a magic to it all we we were considering, we didn't end up doing it, but we were considering like getting our album done, getting it totally um, mixed the way we wanted to to run it. And then there's a really nice studio nearby that has a, a, a Studer tape machine. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember how many tracks it is. It's a pretty large one, but I can't remember how many tracks it is. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and we were just gonna run the whole album through it just just because. <laughs> and uh, well, I don't know how much uh, saturation or any kind of coloration we would have got out of it, um, mm-hmm. but it was talked about briefly. Um, and now I'm kind of curious to hear what that might have sounded like. Sure. And for me, even it's not necessarily the the sound of it, because um, a lot of the plugins and stuff we have now are really good representations of that old gear. And, yeah. And let's be real. Old gear has a lot of problems. It's been sitting around for everywhere and it's dirty and it makes noise. Um, I know I can record digitally and it will sound better than a POS mixer. I get off of eBay for 50 bucks. That's been around since 1978. Mm-hmm. But on that old mixer, I get to move the faders. You know, I I get to turn knobs. It's not just me and my mouse and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's actually what I want out of it is the interaction more so than the tone. 
the just the the feel of the actual hands-on feel of everything. Right. I feel like you you interact it with it differently. I and I think that can, you know that can be said for guitars too. Like some guitars you play and it's just like yeah cool it's 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 another guitar, and then you'll get one that just for whatever reason you play different on it and it's and it talks back to you as you're making music with it. And I think a lot of that can be found in in some different recording equipment. And I feel the computer, while it's an amazing tool, has taken a lot of that away. I could I could definitely see that. I can I can totally see where you're coming from. I really liked uh Dave Grohl's documentary about that Neve console and it really kind oh, of triggered yeah, the, a lot the, of those. The Sound City documentary. Yeah. That was fantastic and uh, really triggered a lot of those kind of those same feelings and, and desires of what you're talking about in, in me. Like, wow, that is just so amazing. And it's just like you say, it's the actual interaction with the piece, mm-hmm. probably, probably more than the, than the gear itself, if right. that makes any sense. And, and here's a good example, too, because I still work you know, at a studio here in Albuquerque, and we get bands that come in and, and they've kind of already figured out what they want to do. And they say, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to start with the drums. We're going to lay that down first. And then we're going to have our two guitar players. They're going to do the rhythm parts. And then we're going to overdub the bass in the, in the control room. Then we're going to overdub, you know, this, like they have it all set out. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes we ask us like, well, you guys are never going to play together. No, no, we're going to do it all individually and separate and layer it and do it. You guys are a band, but you're not going to play together. Right. No, 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 no. We're going to do all. It's like, okay, that's, you know. And it's so funny how it's almost, that's the whole point of being in a band is playing together. And you get this opportunity to come into a studio and capture that moment and save it forever. And you're saving something when you never even played together on it. Right. Not actually. I don't know. It's just a totally, it's so interesting on how much it's changed. And that seems to be the normal way to do things. I mean, more so than not. And correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but that's just that's what's the you know standard operating proce- procedure almost. And mm-hmm. we did that to a degree, but um, lesser, less so. So I don't. You work in a studio, so you can tell me if this is common at all. What we did was we set the drums up, got them all mic'd up the way they <clears throat> we wanted. Um, had a guy come in and tune them all up for us and get everything, get the drum sounding right on the money. And mm-hmm. then we, we did, we all played together, but we didn't necessarily keep anything but the drum tracks. Um, sure. Sometimes, sometimes we did depending no, on, I think that's, I think that's very common and that's a, that's a great way to, if you want to isolate what you're doing with the drums um, but you still have the feel of everybody playing together. That is really common. Um, and you get great results doing that too, because it, it can be difficult when you have everybody going in at the same time and not, maybe not necessarily all in the same room, but if you have everybody going at the same time and, um, you know, one person screws up, you got to do it again mm-hmm. and totally understand that studio time is expensive. And from a commercial standpoint, the old way of doing it doesn't make any sense at all. But that's what's so cool about all those old recordings and old musicians is they were that good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, they they knew that they all had to be in the same room using the same four mics, and if someone screwed up, they had to do it again. Mm-hmm. And that's just the way it was. Well, you get guys like the the wrecking crew or something all together in the room together. Right. It's like that's ridiculous level of talent. Like ridiculous. So, I mean, how many guys would they have in a room at the same time? I don't even know. Like more than more than a four or five piece band, right? Just, and I and I bet you the third take they didn't do more than three takes of anything. Yeah, just solid. You know, those were those were musicians. I can't totally. even can't even really put myself in that category. I beat no, on the thing until it nor makes can racket. I. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I I can't do that either. And to just and some of those sessions players where they're, you know, you've seen footage and they don't have a chart in front of them. They don't, they don't even know what key the song is in. They just hear the singer start and they play. Mm-hmm. I cannot fathom the hours and the 
hours it took of practicing those those um, listening skills and all that kind of stuff to be able to be that caliber of player to just walk in and make it happen. Right. And and to keep things relatively related, they had great tone too. And yes. we're in like the we are in like the golden age of gear, in my opinion. I mean, yes, everything vintage is is cool and has a story and a and a feel to it. But as far as like most of the gear out there right now, we're in a total golden age. The quality's never been better. There's oh, new sounds definitely. coming out that that were never possible before. But what I'm where I'm going with this is those guys had solid gear and had amazing tone and were right on the money. And I don't think that really exists that much anymore. Right. I think I've been guilty of this too, that a lot of times when we're like, man, I don't sound the the way I want to, you know, I start, you know, combing the the pages of musician's friend or whatnot, looking for, Oh, you know what I need is this. When what I really need is more practice. <laughs> That's me. That's me to you, a T. You know, if, <laughs> if I wasn't surfing, looking at all the cool stuff I could buy and just worked on, you know, playing that a little more, it'd probably be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh man. Well, Justin, this has been a, a great talk, but we have actually cl- we've clicked over the hour mark a little bit, and that it's kind of sad because I feel like the conversations. I hate eating up everyone's time, but oftentimes uh, I feel like the conversation's just getting fired up when it's time to shut off. And, sure. Uh, and uh, the old joke that I've been using is everyone's everyone's uh, in their cubicle listening, and their boss is already mad that they've wasted more than their lunch hour listening to me talk about nonsense so well that's why you just tag that bathroom break right before your lunch hour and right after so if you're listening you're fine you're still right in there oh you're yeah you're good just keep keep going (laughs) and we'll give we'll give justin just a few more minutes to shamelessly plug anything that he's he wants to plug um you know, of course, I would really appreciate, you know, anybody checking out Agave Audio. I would really appreciate that. But you know what? At the From what we were last talking, I'm just going to plug practicing. Okay. Really. <laughs> you know, I would love for you guys to buy a pedal. But if you have to choose between buying a pedal for me and practicing, go practice. That'll be my plug. <laughs> that, that is a very generous, generous offer. So uh, I'll have the link to your website in the show notes. Where else can appreciate people find it. you? Um, yeah, so the website, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Um, those are the, that and the website, those are the best places to find me at for Agave Audio. Okay. And there then you go. For, if, if people don't know it, it's A-G-A-V-E. Right. I've, I've run into, I've run into people that don't know that, yeah, well, that word, so. Yeah, that's understandable. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Well, I'll go ahead and wrap up then, so. All righty. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Blake. We'll have to do it again. Most definitely. Most definitely. So, for Justin, I'm Blake. And as always, folks, good luck and good tones. I'll talk to you later. All righty, folks. That is your show for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. And thanks to Justin for coming on. I am pretty stoked. This is my last episode that will be dropping before I head to NAMM, which is actually tomorrow as of this recording. So it'll be my first NAMM. I'm pretty excited. I will be bringing back all kinds of juicy information. So make sure you're tuned in to all the Tone Mob social media stuff, the email list, and this very podcast, because I'm sure we'll be talking about NAMM for quite some time. And the last thing I'd like to leave you guys with is don't forget about the Tone Mob Associates. It's a nice, easy way to support the show. You're probably purchasing things on Amazon anyway, right? Maybe your wife is. Maybe your grandmother is. All you got to do is uh, send them on over to ToneMob.com associates, and they can see the Amazon link there. Anything that gets purchased through there, We'll come right back and help support the show. And I thank you very much in advance for doing so. That does it for this week. Stay tuned. 
stay safe, and as always, have yourself a good week. One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com slash StringJoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring and he makes it simple and his customer service is top notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.